Hey, welcome to Ha Ha Horde House with your host, myself, Mark Trinidad. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian based in Canada, originally from a little island in the Caribbean called Trinidad. I've been doing stand-up comedy now for the past uh, 30 plus years. That's a bit of time. But in my 30 years, I, I, I've gotten involved in an art form that I have so much respect for and so much love for, but I've met so many other comedians that are involved in it that I really wanted to know more about their origin story uh, and their journey in the world of stand-up comedy. So I started this vlog slash podcast to, to get more in depth in understanding what were the things that came to pass that caused them to get involved in comedy. So if you happen to be a person that's interested in that kind of story, welcome aboard. And today, our episode number one in what I expect to be a many, many more years of talking to comedians is with Leonard Chan. And Leonard Chan actually inspired me, his story inspired me to wear this particular jersey from my good friends across at geekyjerseys.com who have a wonderful line of geeky hockey jerseys, baseball jerseys, nerd movie paraphernalia that I, I encourage you to check out. They're not a sponsor of the podcast. They're just somebody that I, I love and I enjoy and I enjoy wearing their artistic endeavor. So check them out. This particular one is inspired by the series from Breaking Bad, Heisenberg. You guys would remember that. So uh, hopefully during my conversation with Leonard, you'll start to understand why I chose this jersey. I'd also like to thank J Bird Digital Arts for all of our lovely graphics of our logo, our Instagram, and our uh, overlays in the Zoom video. So J Bird Digital Arts on Facebook, you can find him there. But without further ado, let's jump across and listen to the podcast. So we start off this meeting by saying how stupid I am. It is wonderful. <laughs> it's beautiful. I don't know how you made it over a year into this pandemic without figuring out Zoom works. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm telling you the truth, okay? I've done probably in total three Zooms in the entire year since this thing started. <laughs> It's pretty sad to have to admit that because it just means that I have not been working. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. So basically, let's just call this podcast like Boomer, OK Boomer, OK Zoomer. Like that's <laughs> what we're doing now. Yeah, that's that's probably the best. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Boomer versus Zoomer. Or Boomer meets <laughs> Zoomer or something like that. Yeah. Yo, you got Yoda in the background. Forgive my ADD, but I see these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, you got baby Yoda in the background, dog. Yeah, my, uh, my is... friend crocheted this for me. Yo, you had somebody actually made it for you? Yeah, this is before Disney was like, this is before Disney had uh, put out any merchandise and everybody loved baby Yoda. So then my friend was like, I will make one for you. And then she crocheted it. <laughs> Wow, that's a wicked friend, though. Don't, I bet nah, we shouldn't call attention to it. Disney might find out and you might get hit with a copyright or some sort of nah, cease and desist she wasn't orders. Selling them. She just made one for me. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. She, dude. she made no money off it. She really made no money off of it. <laughs> I wore the wrong jersey for, you see, I wore, I wore my geeky jerseys, but I should have worn my Mandalorian jersey. I wore the, uh, I wore the, I'll show you. I'll, Oh, nice. You're a Breaking Bad jersey. Yeah. Breaking Bad jersey. It's still, it's still oh, geeky. I wore the wrong one. It's, it's named after a <laughs> physicist. It's geeky. Yeah. And your background. Okay. All right. This. All right. Let me let me tell you the whole concept behind this, this wonderful little vlog podcast YouTube thingy that I started and why I started it. The whole concept behind it is that uh, I became a comedian, but I've never had in terms of of course, I know my life. I know my journey. I know my genesis. But yeah. other comedians, I've heard such varied stories about how they got into the world of comedy, right? Gotcha. And of course, I also have, you know, the background of my parents saying it's not a career choice because I'm from the Caribbean. It wasn't really a career choice. You could make in the Caribbean, oh. in North America, totally different. So finding out your background story. Okay, where... 
how how did you get into comedy, man? It just because I know you had a professional background, right? Yeah. You had an intellectual, inter- intelligent background, which I, of course, as you know me for all these years, you know I'm not that intelligent. So I'm always <laughs> fascinated. What what is your background? What did you study to become? I studied to become an engineer. So you studied I have two degrees. which kind of engineering? Chemical. Chemical engineer. So Breaking Bad is a good choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's a thing. Fa- yeah, kind of. I mean, I'm not a chemist, though. That's different. So like Heisenberg uh, was a chemist. So he understood right. how the reactions happened, all that stuff. Chemical engineers don't understand chemistry. Like, that's not our thing. Like, I was terrible at chemistry. Like, I, I understood basics, but like, you know, like I've, I've known chemists who are like, you could tell, you could just give them like three different molecules, like the temperatures, whatever, whatever he needed to know. And he could tell you exactly what would happen when they reacted on a chemical level. And like, that's, nice. I can't do that. It's insanity. Um, what I do, chemical engineers are, are about process. We're process engineers. So our job is to design systems that take raw materials and turn it into something worth something. You know, so like, that's why a lot of chemical engineers end up working in oil refineries, because that's basically all it is. You're taking like crude, raw, or raw crude, or, uh, you know, tar. And then you're creating, like you're designing the systems, like all the pipes and stuff uh, to like, turn that into something worth more. So I don't know what's happening. I don't really know what's happening inside the pipes. I know where all right, the right, right. go. <laughs> That's the basic way to explain it, yeah. Were you already employed in that type of, of job, right? And then yeah. the bug of comedy hit you? How did comedy slap you and say, you know, this is what you're going to do? Oh, man, I've been, I've been in that business for almost 20 years. Um. I was probably in the business from a 15 before I started comedy. Uh, like I was. So you were actually doing that, doing the chemical engineering. You were actually working for a company doing chemical engineering. Yeah, I was design. an environment. I was, I actually so I did the, a master's. I was, so I did my, my bachelor's in, in chemical engineering, but I did my master's also in chemical engineering, but that was like more an environmental bent. So it was more like environmental microbiology. So I had like, I discovered, I discovered new bacteria for like, uh, for degrading polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which is an environmental contaminant uh, that is used in all sorts of stuff like uh, wood treatment, like creosote, uh, like coal tar stuff. And, uh, and it, it's a common environmental pollutant, but it, it tends to stick around because the polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, are yeah. just by nature a very persistent molecule. They're very difficult to break down. But I right. uh, was trying to find cheaper ways to do it. And I learned that certain bacteria could be incentivized to do it, like under certain conditions, whatever, whatever, whatever. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, because I did that uh, master's, I ended up in the environmental field. Because I've always had like, I've, I've always been into climate change stuff. Like, you know, like I want to save the world, basically. It'd be nice. Uh, so I spent basically. Well, that's years, a... um, I spent twenty years designing. Doing, doing do, that, skills. yeah, yeah, that was my job. Okay, but did did the idea of comedy come prior to that, or it was during that? It was. During, you know what I mean? Like, at no point. It, it was during. Did I ever consider um, comedy as a career? Uh, what I wanted was to be a writer. Uh, early on, I've always loved to write. That's always been my thing, uh, very, very right. early on. Uh, but I never considered that to be a viable career. And I always liked science. And I, so I thought, eh, let's be an engineer. You know, it's probably... Uh... Okay, let's, let's back up some more. All right. So you were already gainfully employed. 
Yes. And this is the thing. People who are gainfully, like I have friends who are lawyers that left being lawyers, closed their practices down to become comedians, which just is baffling to me because, you know, it, my background, my schooling is high school level and, and yeah, okay. a little bit, just, just a little bit beyond high school level. I was studying to become an accountant. And the only oh, reason I was studying to become an accountant is because accounting is very basic. <laughs> I just, in and out, it's it's and numbers. It's it's yeah. basic. It was the only thing. That's all I understood. It's just that's all that my mind, ADD mind, could grasp. So I started yeah. it off because my parents were kind of like, "Well, it's what you're good at. It's what you got your passes in. Let's push you across in that direction." And I did the first yeah. year of accounting school, and I realized, ah, uh, no. And I met somebody who was into theater and stuff like that. And, and that started my journey. But you were already 15 years in. You knew you liked writing. Was the writing thing from school before? Like you always knew that you wanted to be a writer. So as a kid, were you uh, creating cartoons? What, what were you doing as a kid? Yeah, that, when I was a kid, I wrote, yeah. like I wrote a novel in grade 10 and 11. Uh, I just wrote a lot. Um, so you like and, stories? Uh, I like stories. Yeah, I like stories. I like, I like words. I like language. I like, I love language. Like I love, it's, you know, like building sentences. I like uh, the construction of, ah. you know, like phrases. I like uh, finding efficient ways to communicate. I like finding artistic ways to, com to communicate and get across complex ideas in ways that are interesting. You know, I like, and I like stories. So I wrote a lot. I always was a writer. Like when, even in uh, university, you know, like I was engineer, but like I also, um, you know, like I also uh, did a minor in English almost like I was really close to getting mm. a minor in English. I think I'm like one or two credits away. Uh, so, but all my electives were like English courses, creative writing, writing, whatever, whatever. So yeah. And so then when I, when I graduated, like I was still working uh, as an engineer and, and then I ended up getting into sales, like sa engineering sales. So that's, so there's a lot of public speaking already. So that was fine. And I actually turned a lot of my like sales presentations into like comedy routines. Cause I realized that you know yes. if i'm trying to teach people and sell somebody on something if i make them laugh like they're in like it's the trojan yes. horse right yes and so it's the way to incept people with ideas is through laughter through emotion really like but because you don't want to make people sad in a presentation so laughter is the best. yeah yeah so, it's it, like, in sales they always teach you find something that you two can agree upon and yes. build on that, whether it be family, a hobby, like sure. a sales rep would walk into your room now and just immediately pick up probably why I picked up on your Yoda and then find a commonality between the two yeah. and, and build on that. So you're, yeah. you were utilizing comedy as the building blocks to set up that relationship to make your sales. Yes, correct. Yes. So, um, but during that time, I was also writing screenplays. So I decided I wanted to like, instead of writing novels, I was like, I'm gonna start writing scripts. I gotta learn how to like, I teach myself how to write screenplays. I like read books, I joined like groups and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, and, and you know, like I, you know, I, I would, I got a couple jobs, you know, writing, uh, like doing rewrites on things and like, uh, and we came close to making some things. Like we had like a few million bucks in funding for like a movie. And we had John Stamos attached for like a hot second. And then he got full wow. bothered and then off he went. And then what happened, and then basically all that happened was like, I was like, man, all these screenplays, it's so hard to get anything made. And I wanted to get into a writer's room, but I didn't, because I was already like working as an engineer, like I was, I was getting pretty high up, uh, you know, like I was, I was managing people, like I was the head of a department, you know, it was just like, I can't go, I, I just couldn't bring myself to be like intern and like fetch coffee or whatever mm. that you would have to do, like if you're just starting out. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. because like I had, because I had to start somewhere. 
I yeah. built it, I know. And honestly, if I was in my early, early 20s, yeah, 100%. But at this point, I was in like my early 30s, mid 30s. And I was like, I can't, I just, I have too much infrastructure in my life built up in terms like that I, because of this career, like I have a mortgage, I have like car payments, I have all this stuff. And I was like, I can't. You know, I have responsibilities and I can't just go be an intern as much as I would love to. Like, I would love to. It's not that I don't want to do that. It's just I f couldn't afford to do that. So I was like, well, I need a different uh, way into this because I want to be a writer, but uh, I need to pad my re get my resume to be good. So, and all right. these words that I'm writing are just going into drawers. So I was like, well, I just need to say these words myself. And what's the way to do that? And I was like, well, I can't act. Uh, so let's and then try you saw... and what... Yeah. Yeah. And I'd always loved comedy, like from the beginning. Like I used to make little comedy mixtapes when I was a kid. I would listen to uh, Chum FM, uh, like 104.5 Chum FM. They had this thing called the Sunday Funnies. So I'd listen to that. Like yes. every, yeah, yeah. every Sunday. And I would make comedy mixtapes. So like Carlin, Newhart, like Cosby, uh, you know, like Dennis Miller, like when he was a thing, like just all that stuff. Uh, I like, love, I love his rants. His rants were legendary yeah, yeah, in my yeah. eyes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Like just throwing a bunch of obscure references and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Um, but yeah. So then I really, I, I, you know, that's like what I. Uh, so then, because I always loved comedy, and I've I've been using comedy, and I was doing a lot of public speaking, and I just want I was like let's. The strategy was let's start doing comedy. Uh, also because so I got that you could utilize the words. Utilize the words. That you were already writing. Yeah. And then I can make a name for myself in comedy somehow. But really it's more about the craft more than anything. It, was, it wasn't so much like, oh, I'm going to be famous or whatever. But I was like, but if I can like get good at comedy, then I can say, hey, look, I'm pretty good at comedy and maybe that will be of value to you in a writer's room and I could just like backdoor my way in. Mm -hmm. So um yeah that's that a good way cool. to make the connection. Yeah. Yeah my Did, well, were also, your parents supportive of this? What's that? Wait, okay, hold on. Put a pin in that. Your your brother in law is a comedian already? Yes. So you already had so you had an avenue for which you could have talked to someone that had knowledge and then did you go out like see him perform and stuff and it kind of yeah i saw oh, him. Well, he's in vancouver i saw him perform a couple times in vancouver he started he basically started about three four years before i did and um and so then he was like running shows and and because like for my my job it involved a lot of travel so i could travel anywhere right. i wanted in canada or even sometimes the states and but basically like I was out in Vancouver, you know, meeting with some clients and then he was out there and he was running a show and I was just like, well, nobody knows me here, but you, I'm going to bucket list. Let's just do this one time, see how this goes, see if it's fun. And then I went right, right, right. and I did this open mic. I wrote like four minutes the night before, five minutes the night before, and then I did it and it didn't go awful. And I just kind of kept doing it basically. And that's the honey and trap. Then, it then didn't go awful. awful. What's that? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't go awful. That's, it wasn't great. But yeah, but that, that's the honey trap. That's that's how surfers get into surfing. The first time they try it, they didn't drown or didn't they didn't, down. you know, hit the head yeah. on a reef. They kind of like felt that little half a second of like, I'm doing it. And then that just traps you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, basically so yours didn't go well, like, bad. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. I, 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 like I went, it was an open mic in the basement of a pizza joint. So like, well, the stakes were really low. It was uh, Goldie's. I had to follow, by right. the way, a lot of pros dropped in. I had to follow K-Trev. Like my first set ever, I followed K-Trev. Wow. Uh, yeah. a, a god of, of comedians nowadays in Canada, K-Trev. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, the stakes are low. It'd be like if you're surfing in Waikiki, you know, like it's very gentle waves. People are very nice. Like I'm not going to North Shore, you know, where I'm going to get smoked on the reefs. Like I'm... Waikiki. 30 stories of, of waves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. None of that. None of that. So yeah, yeah and that's basically how it started. And then I and then I took I, I came back to uh, Toronto and I did 
like a few sets here and there. Like maybe my first year I did like maybe like four sets maybe because I still had a full-time job. And then the next year, then my friends bought me a, a gift certificate to Second City. So then I did that. I started taking improv. Right. I thought, well, this will be fun. Do improv. And then improv was great because it gave me a lot of stage time, like just to like do things and like learn that skill. Like improv is so, I think like, I don't know if you think this, like, but like, I know mm. like with stand-ups and improvisers, there's like sort of eh, kind of like a rivalry almost. In, yeah, in a lot I, I get, here's the thing with me and improv. I just realized yeah. that it's a different muscle that needs to be exercised in order to become proficient in it. I, I, yes. I'm not like, I didn't come up because I'm from the Caribbean and all I had was back in my day, records, you know, to, to listen to and the occasional uh, special that would pop up. I didn't have the animosity that North Americans probably had because they had comedy clubs they could go to or they could interact with. I had nobody to interact with. So I never had any of that animosity that some yeah. stand-up comedians have for prop acts, for, for ad-libbers, for, I'd never had all of that nonsense in the background. So yeah. I look at it in a truly philosophical way in that if you make a person laugh, you're a comedian. I don't care how you do it. Uh, Mr. Bean does it without saying a damn word, right? Um, uh, Carrot Top does it with all his props. To me, yeah. if you're getting the same result, then you, you're one of us. You're, you're one of the people that want to take of their lives to make other people's lives a better place. They make them happy. We're doctors in a way in that we, we make people feel good and, and that's all I care about. So I, I didn't have that animosity. It's just uh, ad-libbing is just another muscle, but it, it's, oh my God, it's a craft that you need to work on to be able to get oh, yeah. that muscle to work really well. Yeah. Absolutely. So I have I a think, lot of respect think, for it. Yeah. I think, I think it's important that comedians do improv because it teaches you a lot of uh, very important things that you need to, I think early on too, it's good to know uh, because like, Obviously, stand up is a very solitary game, right? Like you're up there twisting in the wind. It's not a team sport. Improv is a team Kinda. sport. Kinda. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, like, when you're doing stand up, uh, oftentimes, like, at least, especially when I, at the beginning, like, I would write my bits and these are the words I'm going to say. And if things went wrong, it was like, ah, yep. rah, right? But improv teaches you about, you know, the opportunities that come with failure, you know? And, yes. and then sometimes some of the best, the best improv scenes come from mistakes, you know? And, uh, yes. and I think yes. like that was, um, yeah, that was like, you know, I think that was an important lesson early on. And then it helped, helped me loosen up, you know, like become a better performer. Yeah. Cause I wasn't really ever a performer. That wasn't my goal in life, right? Like I wanted to be a writer, but performance was a whole different animal, you know? So yeah. Yeah, so I think it was. I think it's important for every uh, comedian to do both. In, uh, in terms like, of improv, will help you greatly with stand up. Although stand up will ruin your improv if you try to take, <laughs> if you try yes. to like take yeah. the principles well, of stand up into improv, it'll it'll mess you up. Because improv, improv, your like, the goal of improv to create a great scene, you do not start with like a joke, right? Comedians, we're looking for the jokes, but improv yes. no you can't because if you start a scene with a joke now you're trapped in having to come up with better jokes to top that scene to make it go with improv like the the key is to look for the emotion of the scene emotion first character second some sort of physical thing third and then jokes last if you find the emotion of the scene and you can play that the jokes will come right so it's like look yeah for yeah, the yeah, story, yeah yeah look for the story uh, but it's look not it's not the most important thing yeah, exactly. Like, and, yeah, that's yeah. because of my background in theater. Yeah. Um, I, I and this is live theater, right? Yeah. You have to be able to understand what your character is, uh, the background of your your character. So that if yeah. you're if you're interacting with someone on stage and they miss a line, you have to be able to within your character, bring them back into the scene and find subtle ways of reminding them what their line is. So to be able to ad lib that within your character, I can see the value in that 
because I've utilized that to become a stand-up comedian so that when I'm in an environment and something, even though I stayed in a dark room just like you and wrote lines that I had rehearsed down to, I knew where to breathe, where to inhale, where my inflections were. If something happened in the audience that took me out of that and I had to you know, comment about it, I could still come back in eventually to what my lines were and what my thought patterns were and etc. So yeah, it's an extremely valuable uh, thing to have in your arsenal to be able to ad lib, to be able to create like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and so yeah, so I ended up just doing improv for like a year and a half, two years actually after the standup thing. And then um, I met this girl in, my, in my, one of my last improv classes, uh, Heather mm. McDonald, do you know, you know Heather McDonald, right? Yes, I've crossed that name somewhere in my career. Yeah, so she, um, she used, I mean, I think it's gone now because pandemic, but she ran this great show uh, at uh, Poor Boy, it was called, and then it became something else, like Bureaucracy. It was comedy on Tuesday. Right, right, right. It was her and Claire Belford who ran this show yes. together. And yeah. uh, anyways, like, so she was doing stand-up and then she started doing these, she did this competition, flat tire comedy at the Amsterdam Bicycle Club, which was run by yes. this uh, comedian, Chrissy Cunningham, who was deaf. Yes. And uh, yes, and lawyer, by the way, lawyer. That's lawyer. one of the lawyers that I, I yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, a, she's a lawyer. She quit comedy to finish law school and she hasn't come back. Um, and uh, she, so she was running that show. Heather went to compete in that show because improv is very supportive. Like we all went out to support Heather. And then when I was watching, uh, her doing comedy, I was like, you know, maybe I should get back into stand up. And that's basically, and then I, so then the next like week, and then like two weeks later, I decided to do that same competition. I won the competition. And then, um, and then Chrissy Cunningham was like, hey, do you want to co produce this show with me? Just randomly, just asked me. Like, I just met her, but she was like looking for an adult who <laughs> she could rely on <laughs> with uh, production. So then I was like, yeah. And it made hard to find that in the stand up comedy world. <laughs> yeah. And it made sense because, like, I knew looking at how other people were doing it, like, a lot of people, there's like a culture, there's like a hustle culture in comedy, right? Where, like, you must grind, you must do like six shows a night, and you must go blah, 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 and go crazy, right? And I was like, yeah. No, I, I can't do that, man. I got a full time job. Like, I, I, I travel a lot for work. I was like, no, I got to find yes. all the efficiencies, all right? So I was like, oh, if I start my own show, that guarantees me time every yeah. day. You, stage time. You looked at it like an engineer. <laughs> like, an, How do I make it more efficient? I love yeah. those words because yeah. that's what comedians do. We, we write a joke and then we find words to take out of the joke or insert a word that would eliminate three words so i see yeah. the way that you're thinking and i like the way that you're thinking because but it just took me a lot of years to realize that you just realized that from the onset because of your background it's beautiful love it yeah yeah well the other thing was this is like and i also re recognized i was like it's not about the quantity of the stage time it's about the quality of the stage time because yes. comedy yeah, yeah. as you know is an iterative process Right, it's about it's trial and error. You write a thing, you take it out to crowd, you see what works, you see what doesn't, you keep the stuff that works, you jettison the stuff that doesn't, you fix the stuff that doesn't, and then that's how you make bits stronger and stronger and stronger. Yes. But if you have crappy audiences that you're doing this in front of, you're not getting good data, right? So, what was important wasn't the quantity; it was the quality. So. I had to go into, and because I had limited stage time at the beginning, also because of my job, I was like every. Um, every time I go on stage, I have an intention. I have a plan. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to test this tag. Does this tag work? Do, did these previous things like that worked before, are they still working? And so on and so forth. And it was just like everything, it was, it was like hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, repeat, 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 repeat. And uh, also, I also understood there's a bartering system in comedy. So like I was producing bartering. a show now. I was producing a show now, which meant I had stage time that I could trade. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I see it. Right? I understand. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then that was my way of getting as much quality stage time as possible. 
because I would, yes. so I made sure to create a show where the stage time was good, where we had audiences every week. That was important. Because if you're just performing to an empty room, it was a shit, right? You can't trade, it's, it's, it's not, then your stage time isn't worth as much. Yeah, the, you're, making, you're making what you have the ability to trade more valuable. Exactly. Right? So you're thinking so, like a producer. If I want to get the best comedians on my stage, I got to make sure their butts in the seats to give them the laughter that they're looking for, which will make yes. them enthused, go tell their friends, and more people will want to get on my stage better. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. That's, so I, there was I always up, a theme inside of comedy, yeah. uh, comedians, where you want to get more stage time, put on your own show. It's not just putting on your own show so you get stage time, but you have that ability to barter to be able to get onto other people's stages. Yes, and so different yeah, types of audiences. Yeah. Not just my yes. audience, as their audiences, right? Because you want to be able to test your material in front of as many different On kinds various, of people as possible. Yes. Because that yes. is how you battle test stuff, right? And that, that's, that's yeah. why like right now, there's like a lot of comedy silos. And I think that's very, very detrimental to the development of certain comedians. Like there's comedians who are like, I will only do uh, like safe queer spaces. There's comedians who are like, I will only do these crazy danger rooms. There's comedians who are like, I'm doing stuff for this. I'm doing stuff for this. Yes. You got to get out, do everything. That's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had I 25 years ago, I had that conversation with uh, because I started off on the black circuit, right? Yeah. On the Nubian circuit. And I had yeah. that conversation with Different Jamaican hand. comedians. I'm like, you're playing constantly to your people who understand what you're saying because you have such yeah. a strong dialect and, and yeah. a lot of words that aren't utilized in, in other cultures. If you truly want to make this a career, you have to come out of that bubble and be able to do exactly what you do, but be able to do it for an audience that may not have the little uh, catchphrases that you have. So if you want to make it a career. So being able exactly. to play a varied audience like that is, is essential to the development of you and your talent and your you know, career as the case may be. But the most right. successful comedians are the ones who know how to build bridges. Like that's kind of, so like that's still my job. Engineer, I build bridges. Comedians build bridges. Like you're trying yeah. to build, Yeah. you're trying to create a bridge between your perspective on the world, which is informed by all your experiences, yes. everything that makes you who- The you books are, you read, the people you hang out with. Yeah. So, yeah. And so um, a really important like thing for comedians is self-discovery, self-awareness. Like you have to know where you're coming from, why you think the way you do everything, everything, everything. So that's part of it. Then the other part is you have to then find ways to bridge, like to uh, communicate what you are thinking and what, how you see the world to the audience, to everybody, as many people as possible. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, if you're yes. just talking to people who already agree with you, then yeah, whatever. But if you can convince a crowd that does not agree with you to agree with you because you are funny. Yes. Like, yeah, that's the skill. You know, that's, that's like, that's the art of the whole thing, right? So then there's, there's a comedian that I interacted with. I'm trying to remember. <sighs> I can't remember his name. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I met him out in Alberta and his mm -hmm. shtick was to start off his set with a, a phrase, a word, or a thought pattern that was so counterculture to what everybody in the room felt, right? right. So if, if he walked into a Trump supporter room, he would yeah. start off by saying something nice about Hillary because he was digging himself a hole because yeah. to him, the entertainment was, how do I get people that think so opposite to me to come yeah. into my realm of thought. And yeah. he just dug this hole that, and he was brilliant at it. I can't remember. Was it Wesley? Wesley Santos? It, it was brilliant uh, to watch though. But this is to, what Bill Burr does. Yeah. Yes. Right? That's yes. Bill Burr's thing. That's something who's was like, yeah, women should stay in the kitchen or whatever. Like some, or like, yeah. uh, you know, equal pay is ridiculous or whatever. And then he'll have, yes. he makes his thesis. You know, like he states his thesis. And then people are like, yeah. And then he finds ways to prove it that are He's like a lawyer. airtight. Yes. Exactly. So even if yeah. you don't agree, you're just like, well, yeah, the logic holds up. And that's a really some important points. part of comedy. A really yeah. important part of comedy is the logic of it. You have to make sure everything is logically consistent with reality, first of all, but also like within the scope of the argument that you're making, like you, you have to like 
you're creating a universe, essentially. It's the same thing with writing scripts, right? You make the rules at the beginning and you just cannot break those rules. That's the covenant that you have with the audience. Um, yeah. And so I, like, I liken it's, it to, because, because I'm from the Caribbean, I spend a lot of my time swimming in the ocean. And I know there are Caribbean yeah. people out there that don't swim. And I could, I'm like, how do you live on an island and not know how to swim, right? But it, if you got caught in a current, or a riptide, as they have yeah. in, at beaches, right? You never swim against it because it's going to win. It's going to tie you yeah. out. Eventually, you're going to drown, right? So what they teach you is when that current starts to take you, swim with the current, but you swim at a, a slight diagonal. Yeah. So you're, yeah. use, and you're not getting tired. So you nudge yourself to where that current is no longer going to be while yeah. using it. So to me, in, in an audience that is counter to what I think, the, mm -hmm. the object is to go with them, but nudge them. I don't want to... Yeah bitch slap them, no, don't go against them you know because, yeah i'm not yeah, pimp slapping anybody i'm like i'm taking you slightly into my way of thinking comedy yeah. is all about getting the audience to agree with you that's what yes. laughter is that's especially what applause is applause is like oh yes. my god yes i agree with what you're saying yes so even yes. like yes. which is why like um and I don't count these as applause breaks, like the ones where people are like, oh my God, like the Leafs or go care. There's some shitty pandering thing. And people are like, yes. And I was like, that is- Yeah, yeah, yeah. But There's a difference between pandering. Yeah. That's, yeah. But that is, but that is agreement. And so really like the goal, like when you're doing, like the applause break is like a lot of comedians, you know, for non-comedians uh, out there, like the applause breaks is generally how comedians like, this is how well I did. I got X number of yes. applause breaks, right? Because what that yes, means is yes. you had so many bits where it was like you, uh, you got them to applaud based purely on, like, again, I don't count the pandering ones, but like, if you could say something so clever and so truthful, you know, because comedy also to me is like the deliverance of truth in a very unexpected way. So that's the cleverness of it, right? That's the words, yes. the wordplay, yeah. the way you can phrases, whatever. You can say something where people are like, oh my God, that is it's, so true. Yeah, you it's, can find a crazy it's one thing. There, then they're like, oh, you got me, you know? And then yeah, it's gone. because because it's it's the reason why we comedians love the applause break is because getting them to laugh is one hurdle to cross. Yes. But for yes. them to not just go with the emotion of, I liked what you said, I'm laughing at it, but to, to separate themselves to say, not only, you know, am I laughing at that, I have to step away from it and, and show true appreciation by taking my time to say, yo, listen, you got me good. That was brilliant. Yeah. That was great writing, yeah. the skill set, yeah. right? It, it's a step yeah. above just tearing up a room, right? To get yeah. applause breaks. Yeah, we count yeah. those. Like, I got we three applause those. breaks, yo. It's, it's yeah, yeah. huge. I don't count the last. I yeah. count the applause breaks. Like, because those, yeah. those are like the, the marker. But yeah, my favorite applause breaks right now are the ones where people are like, they applaud, but they're groaning at the same time because they're so mad. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, ah, oh, damn it. That's, I can't yeah. believe he got me to say that I, I like Trump. Trump. <laughs> I love that. I, 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 those are my favorite because it's like, clearly I'd said something offensive or controversial or yeah. whatever, but it's so true that it just yeah. cannot be ignored. And I love that. That's like the new, that's like- There's, my, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a joke that I, I, that I appreciate so much because when I go on stage and I just pitch the premise, yeah. I already have them going towards where I want them to go. And yeah. it's just from the premise, just laying out the yeah. premise there and they're like, oh, I see where you could be going with this. And I'm like, it's What's brilliant. the premise? Oh, What's the premise? It. Uh, I think that the NFL should start recruiting from school shootings. Oh, because they I can run? leave it there. Dude, <laughs> dude, I leave it there to hang. <laughs> and you hear the people, some groan, and some already yeah. realize where I'm going with it. And I'm like, eh, eh, just take a minute. Just take a minute. Hear me out. All yeah. I'm saying is that if you review the tapes, you're going to see one or two kids Stiff arming other kids, high stepping bodies, running zigzag. All I'm saying is that's a great recruit. That's all I'm saying, right? Just watch the tapes. And but yeah. just from pitching the premise, they start to lean in my direction, and I'm like, I got you. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's a thing that a seasoned comedian has the ability to recognize when he's or she or they got you. Yeah. And that's I, I in the beginning of my career, I shopped or I, I was a whore for laughter. I was going after <laughs> laughter. But as you get older, you go after mm. silence because, yeah, you, you know, well, once you, you have the watch. silence, I got you and I can do what I want with you now because I got that. It's like a guy yeah, having it's... or a gal having sex and you hear that, that, uh, and you're like, I got you. I know what I'm doing. I found that what spot. What are you talking about? I, I've, never, I've never heard yeah. that. What's, the, what's, that, what's that sound? I don't know what you're talking about. I, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm I a virgin. I'm a virgin. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, with what, that uh, wonderful avatar, I can't understand how that happened. You know. <laughs> you look yeah. like, dude, the <laughs> character that you have there looks like... Um, there's a show that my daughter has me watching. Uh, God, it's it's a it's a, hold on, it's a it's a really big one. We just watched an episode of it last night. Something with gi- giants and they eat people and stuff like that. It's oh, Attack a, on Titan! Attack on Titan! Thank you very much for knowing that. I couldn't remember the name because I see it in the Korean writing or a, is it Japanese? I don't know. Whatever. I see Japanese. it in the. the the, the writing and I'm like, uh, they, they eat people. It, it's weird to me, yeah. but you have a, a face of one of the characters of that. Show. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's, that's uh, exactly it. Like I think like the more into my career I've gotten at the beginning, yeah, it was like laugh for and anything for the laugh, which by the way, led me to some poor decisions in terms of like some of the material I would do because it was like, which I'll get into in a second, but like, now I understand yes. it's about it's about attention. If you right. can hold, like, especially like you know, like I, I've gotten more into storytelling on stage as well. Like it's it's kind of like a mixtape, right? Like you do some like one liners, some like jokes, and then you know, uh, storytelling. Yes. Which is why, by the way, if you haven't seen it, three mics. Um, yes, yes, uh, of course. Grand special. Yes, yeah, Brilliant, right? Brilliant. So. I like it yeah, because it shows about- it shows that comedians are not just one dime. I know there are comics that get caught up in their shtick in that they're one liners or something like that. But to show using the three mics to show that there's there's so much thought that goes into there's so much emotion that that's involved as well. It, we're human beings. Yeah. And sometimes people don't see us as human beings. They just see us as the jokes. Right. But we, yeah. we have multidimensional characters within there that caused us to become, you know, the writers, the joke tellers, the joke slingers that we became. So I like showing, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this, this vlog podcast thingy is because I want to show who these people are because I have so much respect for the art form. Um, I have so much respect for the individuals and the roads that they have to travel to get into here. I'm very interested in because, I mean, nobody could look at this, right? But to me, just me having these conversations, to me, it's fascinating because I find the entire art form and the people that do it so fascinating because I know my journey and I want to hear everybody else's journey. That's the concept yeah. behind yeah. the ha ha whore house. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, all about like um, adding as much perspective as you can to your own? Yeah. You know, that's why reading is so important, right? Because it's going to be you can't reading and travel. Yeah, yeah, reading and I, travel. I, yeah, I, I travel like reading, good. but travel, travel is huge. Yeah, travel is super important. Yeah, yeah. Just getting outside your bubble, seeing the world, seeing, talking to people who aren't you, talking to everybody. I Dude, love meeting. People. I don't think because like. I don't think I don't think racism could exist if more people had the ability to travel, because when you travel, oh. I mean, I didn't grow up um, here in North America where I was exposed mm-hmm. to. I mean, uh, in Trinidad, my country, the, the, it's called a melting pot, right? Because so many different races uh, are mixing together. We never looked at each other as different races. We were Trinis, right? That's our attitude. Maybe it was a different time that I grew up in, but now you see, uh, now that I've come and lived half my life, because half my life was in Trinidad, the other half has been here. Uh, it's, I think everything has changed now where people are, are digging into these little um, social bubbles that they have and, and claiming too much. I, I might be wrong in my philosophical approach to it, but if more people had the ability to come outside of their zone, and meet people in other zones. I think I said this mm-hmm. before, but and I don't mean to go on a tangent. 
<laughs> but I, I, I saw an interview, I read a book by Chris Hatfield, which was the Canadian astronaut, right? He says that astronauts have a different look or different philosophy on the world because when they're six miles above and they're looking down at the planet, they see two definitions. They see yeah. water, they see land. They don't see these yeah. imaginary boundaries that we've put up to say, this is Canada, this is Indonesia, this is, we don't, they don't have that. They have water and they have land. So when they look at people, they're like, this is a species. This is the human race, right? They see it as one. They don't see it how we down here see and uh, all that we learned in school with these lines and stuff. I just wish more people had the ability to see that. I don't think we need to send everybody up in space to do it. I think think logically we should have the ability to say we're all just living a human experience we want to have a, a roof above our head we want to provide for our family we want to pass on our genes sure. it's about that's it you know you want to yeah. protect your stuff you want to pass, on your, pass on your seat we'll hear the, we'll hear the uh, right let's move <laughs> <laughs> we hit it uh. <laughs> that's how you want to pass on your genes you want to pass it on you want to do it well you want to do it well you want to do a good job yeah. You're an engineer. Yeah. You want to make sure that it's efficient. Exactly. <laughs> That's why when it lasts only 30 seconds, your wife should say thank you because you were efficient, goddammit. Efficiency efficient. is key. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, you know what? At some point before I'm dead, I think I'm going to go to space. I think Dude, it's coming. And, th and this is why I'm glad to have lived to this age where I have the ability to see things that we only looked at in TV shows and, or imagined, you know, I mean, I remember the first Motorola StarTac phone coming out. And I was like, this is just like they had on Star Trek. Cause you had the ability to flip, dit, dit, dit. <laughs> come in captain, right? It was like, it was like magic to me. And now to live to an age where there's going to be space tourism, where we're, we're going to be seeding Mars, right? It's what? Oh my God. To, to put on my yeah. Oculus, because I play with the Oculus. Uh, I play this shooting. Oh, nice. I have uh, a... I, oh. Okay, HB right. Reaver. See, I, it, to, to put that, I remember when Pong came out and it was black and white. It was two lines. Yeah. Boom, boom. I remember that shit, yeah. right? To see yeah. where we are I, now. Yeah, it's crazy. I know. And you still haven't figured out Zoom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, no, my wife really wants to go to space. So I yeah. promised her the moon. I was like, I'll bring, I'll take you to the moon. So now I have to do it. Dude, you know, it's coming, right? Even if you, yeah, no, even the way if I you it is like, financially, you know, what's that? Even, fina if, even if financially it's, it's beyond the realm, it's the fact that it's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the goal and right now is to learn financial instruments so my worth is going this way yeah. while the cost of space travel is going this way. And then hopefully by the time I'm like in my late fifties, it'll, it'll intersect. And then it'll intersect. I go. Yeah. I'm, as you, as you bring that up, I'm learning about financial tools now that I never learned oh, about when I was a kid, you, actually on my sure. other podcast. What are your financial tools? Uh, oh, other e, it's called ETFs. E, oh, you just learned ETFs? about that now? Nice. I just nice. learned about ETFs, dude. <laughs> Yours? Okay. All right. I mean, okay. you should have All probably right. learned, about, learned about Zoom, but yeah. Dude, let's good let's stuff. not go into the, the, the Asian stereotype about being good with numbers and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I when I dropped out of school in terms of going my first year of accountancy, I never wanted to see a number ever again. I was so <laughs> repulsed by it that I locked off 40 years of my life from numbers. To this day, I'm married became, now. Uh, is, is that why you became a is comedian that, so you could avoid money? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You're like, I don't I have to have deal with numbers dude, and money, so I'm just going to do art. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I'm so, I've constantly told people I, I am not interested in money. I'm interested in the things money can do for me but sure. money is not my motivating factor at all. My wife is my manager because I have to get her to talk to people to charge them for what I do because I have no interest in talking about it at all. I have to get somebody else responsible to do that. I can't do it because to me, you're giving me 30 minutes to come and get my high. 
to get my serotonin, dopamine, you know, it, what? Let me come get my drugs. Oh, by the yeah. way, here's how much I charge for it. I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't want to do that. Let my wife handle that stuff. I don't like <laughs> nothing. If my wife, God forbid, were to pass away, I'd be in a mess because I don't know how to run a house. Yeah, I'm really mature, dude. Really mature. Well, I'm the same as you. I like, wish I, I could pay a mortgage with laughter. I don't know where anything is. Like, I don't know what meds the cats are on. I know nothing. Like, if she dies before I do, I'm screwed. She's, oh, there she's, you go. How many? And how many cats you have now, by the way? Oh, I don't even know anymore. How many? I honestly oh don't know. I want to. I want to say eleven. I really don't know. Wow. And you live in Toronto. Yeah. In downtown Toronto, eleven cats in the house. There, there, well, there's yeah, there's a lot of jokes house, about that. House That's downtown to Toronto to me. I live, yeah. I live an hour and a half north, so that's downtown to me, all right? 11 cats. That, I have two, and I hate both of them. <laughs> hate them. You get, they, they, to me, cats represent everything that I hate about growing up, right? It's something that, that looks at you with the most condescending eyes ever. My cats look at me like if... I, I live in their house and yeah. I'm, I'm a boarder that doesn't clean up or wash dishes or stuff. They just give me that look that straight to my soul. I hate them. And I, I don't feed them. I get my, but we pay, I pay for the shit that feeds these bastards. I hate them. I don't <laughs> do them any evil stuff. Don't get me wrong. But I just, to me is a dog is an animal that I want to have. And I've had all my life except for the past 15 years. Right. But a dog tells you every day, dude, I love you. I got your back. I support you. What you need? You want to be homeless and live outside? Great. I could do that with you, man. A cat will always be judging you with those unfriendly eyes. Oh, oh, a dog, a dog acts when he sees you like you just rescued him from an ISIS training camp, right? Like, Dude, I hate it here, but you here now, it's all good. And he loves you. That's what I like about a dog. Can't have that with a cat. Yeah. <laughs> that, sorry. I, just, I know this is not what a sales rep would do this because this just divided us. I'm the dog guy, yeah. you're the cat guy. <laughs> Let's get back to commona commonality. Mandalorian, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I love it, dude. All right, so we've covered your your. Well, we semi. Were your parents supportive when you decided to move away? Because that must have been a shock. That must have been something that they're like, "You're doing what?" I mean, as supportive as any parent could be, that must have been something that caused some chagrin. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, like so. What happened? Uh, like I had this job, and then. I lost the job, actually. Like, I didn't quit. They fired me. Okay. Uh, well, I got right. laid off. I didn't get fired. I got laid off because things were going poorly at the time. Right, right. The whole industry. Companies going a different direction. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. So it was fine. And But, like, I already knew that it's... Like, I had been doing well enough in comedy that I was like, well, I know if this trajectory continues, at some point I'm going to have to make... I'm going to have to make that decision. Do I stay in this job or I do go to comedy, Right. Uh, and right. they made the decision for me, which was great. And then I got like, you know, because they made the decision for me, I also got, you know, a year's worth of severance. So I didn't yes. have to worry about money. So, so with I, that, you had a bump that you had the ability to say, all right, how do I make sure that I keep this, but can I use it for time to, to really dedicate myself towards this comedy career yeah. that I can force? That was yeah. the move. So I told my parents, I was like, listen, I have severance for a year. I'm going to do this hardcore for a year and nothing else. I'm just going to do this. Right. Uh, like I picked up what, I mean, what I did is like, I still wanted money. So like I picked up some writing jobs on the side, like technical writing. Cause like, I know this industry and, and I know that they need like marketing materials. They need all sorts of things. And I had a lot of clients who needed that. And I was like, look, I can write. And you don't have to teach me any of this technology. I know the technology. I used to sell it. Like I understand the entire space. I know the regulations and the technology. So like, give me money and I will write something better, faster 
than the other than whoever you're hiring now because you don't have to teach them the technology i know it right so i picked up some clients doing that and then i had like an extra extra money coming in on top of the severance because that i had a non-compete clause but like i'm not in there selling stuff i'm just writing stuff in fact i'm helping them i'm helping themselves still right right I'm not you know competing against them so i so i did that and so i set that up and i still have those clients now so like i still get like technical writing gigs from time to time and then uh, right. and then I just started like hitting, you know, just going hardcore, like just doing as much comedy as I could get like building material, building craft, blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, like I got the Winnipeg, Com I got my first festival that year. I right. got the Winnipeg okay. Comedy Festival. And then just everything just started snowballing after that, you know? And then it was like, yep, yeah, this year went well. Uh, you know, and as soon as like my parents saw me on TV, they're like, well, now, now we can brag about you to our friends. Right. Cause it sounds important. You know, even though like, That's I, know, how parents I, are. I, I know a bunch of comedians that have been on TV and they still have like 10 roommates. So like, it doesn't, it means nothing, but like to normies, like to citizens, to yeah. muggles, they're like, yeah, you're on TV. <laughs> you're killing it. To the muggles. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I love the Harry Potter reference. Yeah, to the muggles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but once they see you on TV, it becomes something that they can now, as you say, boast to their yeah. friends, but it, it lends validation towards your choice. So yeah, they look yeah, at exactly. it and they're like, yes, you can. Was what obviously because of being on TV, you started to get other people that looked at you as, as well, too. And now you're married. Yeah. Right. How did did anything change in terms of your your wife as well too? I know your parents, uh, right? No, um, she's always been super supportive. She's she always been on, on your side. She quit her job to follow her dreams first. So I supported her I... for a while, and then uh, right, and then yeah, and then when I lost my job to do this, she was like, "No, like she's very much like follow your dreams, man. Do what you want." So uh, and the and the law of reciprocity because you did it for her she can't turn around now and change face and say you can't you can't do yours now too she had to be supportive as well too I'm sure there's a leaning inside there yeah. <clears throat> I think yeah I think I remember in the sales world it's like they they teach you about if you give something to someone you hand somebody a pen it makes them more likely yeah. to sign the contract because you, you gave them something, right? It's like weird, but whatever. That's humans. We are weird, right? Yeah. So that's, that's good, being able to have... And, but I grew up in a time where, uh, where comedians lo were, were looked down upon, uh, essentially, because we're... You've heard the stories about all comedians are derelicts and you know broken human beings and stuff like that. That was a stereotype that I grew up with. So anybody yeah. looking at this career in, in, in the time, in the country that I grew up with, they looked at you as what's wrong. It was always that question, right? Yeah. But once again, to live long enough to see where, no, it's a respected art form. It's a, a respected uh, career and stuff like that. It's so refreshing to be able to see that change come to pass. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad I lived this long. I don't want to leave just yet. I don't want to leave. It's too good. It's too nice now. Despite the pandemic, yeah. I think everything's going to come back and it's going to be nice again. I've had and a good I'll, time I'll, this pandemic. I, I promise really you, complain. I'm going to learn this technology. This is all yeah. part of it. I'm learning the technology. I'll be able to invite you to these Zooms much better than what happened today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. The oh, next one you when we do the dude. sequel, this is going to be amazing. Oh, uh, dude, I, I thought you were going to come on and start ragging me like right away. So uh, let me be forthright so to the three or four viewers. I'm not very good with technology. I know I don't look the part. I look like Grizzly Adams and I should be living in the bush somewhere. But I, <laughs> I still haven't got the hang of sending emails with links in it. Because I was trained when emails came out, links are bad. So to put an email link in to, to touch and get into a Zoom meeting, I didn't know how to do that. So I was reading the round yeah. stuff. I told you how many different IDs for the meeting room. I, okay, I messed up. I won't do it again. I promise. I'll get better, Mr. Engineer. I'll get better. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> 
Well, I, so I now you have you this. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have this incredible career because I've gotten to see you on stage uh, at a few. It's it's been a, a a while now. I've been watching you on stage. Um, yeah. I there's so many comedians now that there there is out there, but there there are people that for some reason I don't know if it's because uh, they they appeal to me uh, on on levels of the writing ability or the performing ability because there's a difference between somebody who writes good comedy and there's somebody who performs their comedy right they're, they're the people that have the ability to do both I've always uh, admired your writing skill but you are also a great performer as well right because they're because of my theater background, I started to understand from an early, you know, in early in my career, positioning on stage, intonations, um, the, mm-hmm. the way you, you inflect your voice and stuff like that. And you have a, a lovely space that you are in where you not only have the writing, but you also have the ability to perform your writing well. And it's lovely to see, and I look forward to actually seeing you just get better and better at it because there's nowhere else that you will go but up because I, <laughs> I see so much good things inside you, man. It's, it's glorious. Aww. It's glorious to watch. For, for a person that studies the art form, there, there's a group of people where, you know, they they rise above you know there's a lot of comedians out there that can make you laugh but the ones that have all the, the ingredients that are baking the proper cake right you to me are one of those that have all the ingredients and it's just coming coming out fluffy and the right amount of sugar and the right amount of spice and it's nice man nice nice i admire your work so much that's Thank why you. i had to have you on that's that's I why I had to that. talk to you. Yeah, dude, I really admire what you're doing, right? Thank and this way, when I was putting on my shows, there, there was a there was a crew of guys uh, and gals and uh, non-binaries. I have to make sure I do the right thing. That that I would put together to to make this this perfect formula for these shows. Oh, I can't wait for things <laughs> to come back. I don't want to put on any Zoom shows. I like the live aspect of it. You know what I mean? There's something that happens when it's it, you're right in front of the person. Uh, that's uh, I, I understand the digital thing, and I understand I have a digital divide, but I love the liveness of it, that, that there's yeah. a danger. There's something, there is. There's something in there the is. air. Yeah. Well, certainly. Um, Can't wait know, for it like to come the, back, man. The immediacy. It's about the intimacy and the immediacy. And yeah. that kind of disappears it's, in Zoom, but, but not really. Because you got to think about it this way. In some ways, Zoom, is, Zoom shows are even more intimate because it's just your face and them in their home. You're in their home now. They didn't come to see you. You are in their space. So they, there is a level of intimacy that you actually don't have when you're in a comedy club. In a comedy club, we're the ones in control, not in Zoom. They're yes. the ones in control. And I miss that. It, yeah, of course. Yeah, of I course. miss that because in, in a comedy club, I... And I don't know how many, how many other comedians do this, but I, and this is why I like uh, the proper lighting in a comedy show where the light is not too bright on your eyes because I like to see everyone's eyes in the audience or at, at least to a level where I could see them because I'm locking eyes with you. I don't perform to foreheads. I don't perform to the back of the room. I perform to eyes. And when I see in a live show that your eyes have drifted away, that you're looking at the waitress or you're looking at the wall or you're interacting with the person next to you. It is my job to bring your eyes back to me. It's something that I've, yeah. I've missed because of this digital, right? Even I have to learn now to look at the camera, to look at the lens in order to make people who are going to look at this, realize that I'm talking to them and not be looking <laughs> down like this at my, you right. I have to learn to do that. It's, but it's a fake eye. The camera yeah. is a fake eye. And I, I want to see your eyes. I want to see you in, I want to see the movement. I want to see the blinking. I want to, I guess because I'm just so deep into that, it's hard to accept change, but yeah. change is inevitable in everything. And I've got to be able to, to catch on to that. You know what I mean? That's but it's difficult. So- 
Yeah, that's the, the most, one of the most important characteristics I think a person needs to have in this world is the ability to adapt, especially in a world that is moving as fast as it is. So yeah. if you're not adaptable, you're screwed. You know, so like the pandemic- yeah, You're the dinosaur, you die. You're yeah. the dinosaur. Pandemic was the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, right? So you just got, you got to evolve. If you don't evolve, you're done. You know, you well, can- I'm, yeah. I'm evolving into this space differently to how I, I'm going from comedian to going into podcaster, vlogger, YouTuber. I'm not yeah. bringing the and same thing. I'm bringing some yeah. skills across, but I'm not bringing the same thing that I did across there into this environment. This is a totally yeah. different environment and I'm going to be doing it with some of the skill sets, but I'm going to abide by some of the rules that they have here. And I'll probably make my own rules in this space as well, too. Well, soon, just the way it is. Um, you know, soon, soon you'll be able to fund this all with your, uh, your ETFs. <laughs> you know which one I'm, I'm investing in? It's, it's called uh, PSHY, uh, but it's, uh, I've, involved, I've involved myself in, in the mushroom world uh, because okay. I, with my ADD and ADHD, they've done a lot of studies where they realize mushrooms have the ability to help people like that and also help people that have traumas and stuff with their brain. So I'm in, involved in, in the, the building of the industry that is next to come. The cannabis in the industry was first. I think psychedelics is the next. So I've, I've involved myself in investing in that industry. So that's what yeah. I'm invested in. Mushrooms, man. So yeah. what about the shrooms, like bro? Of course, of course you like PSHY. You're all about the push. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all about the psyche, man. It's the psyche. <laughs> Wait, is it PSHY or PSYK? PSYK, PS... I'm dyslexic, guy. I don't know these things. It's psychedelics. <laughs> How you spell psychedelics? I'll never be able to spell psychedelics, I think, I but think it's that the, one. Uh, I think the ETF is PSYK, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. PSHY. Okay, is. Yeah, this is... You had Google to check that. I didn't have Google. I had to rely on memory, and I only got, like, three more of these memory cells in there. So yeah, it's... Yeah, oh, dude. It's, uh, it's good. This is a whole different podcast to talk about this stuff, but like once we're done this, let me, I know you just got an ETS, but let me explain to you the world of uh, decentralized finance and it'll blow your goddamn mind. Uh, Bitcoin and stuff like that. That's one. Dude. I've had a few people try to talk to me about it and I'm like, oh, numbers. It'll blow and your I, mind. Like, it'll blow your mind. Ah. The stuff that's available, the stuff that you can do now, the, it's insane. I, well, but after I have I someone. Know. I have someone who is in the financial services world that I'm going to be doing on my other podcast and I'll, I'll do a push for my other podcast. My other podcast is called Mark Trinidad. I don't know shit where I get yeah. people who are involved in industries and jobs and philosophies that I just don't know about to come and talk to me and try and educate me. So I'm talking to a lady inside of that world soon enough who will be able to tell me about all that kind of stuff. Because yeah. this dinosaur needs to learn. <laughs> and what better way to learn than to learn in a manner that has the ability to also teach others at the same time. This is why I like this world. Yay! <laughs> I'm getting there, man. I'm getting there. Slowly. Slowly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I talked to you about doing this about a year ago. And look, I'm finally doing it. So it took You're me a year. <laughs> yeah. Probably but I'm getting there. Yeah. You're getting it. <laughs> All right, bro. All right. Let, let, me, let me let you run because I know you're a busy man and you probably have to build some more bridges of jokes and tags and setups uh, and transitions. So I'm going to let you go, but I want to thank you. Uh, I appreciate you so much for allowing me this, this sliver of your, of your time to find out your Spider-Man story, how that radioactive bug bit you. I appreciate you, my brother. 
thank you very much for doing this. How can uh, I'm going to put it up on in, in the post editing, but how do people find you? Because I know and I've sent a, a, a bunch of work your way as well, too, because when people ask me mm, to do yeah, Zoom stuff, that, I, I tell them I know a guy. I know a guy. You're the guy that I send them to. So how do people find you? What's what's the best way to catch you? Instagram, um, Web page. What is the best yeah, way? I'm, I'm you know what? I've been making fun of you for not knowing Zoom. I am terrible with social media, but I am on it. Uh, you know, so Instagram, it's at the Leonard Chan. Twitter, it's at the Leonard Chan. I have a website, it's www.theleonardchan.com. But that's really more for like Brilliant. corporate. Uh, and then, but it's Facebook. it's branding. You kept everything in there. The Leonard Chan, all in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, because Leonard Chan was taken, so I had no choice. I had to choose the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think anything with Chan is going to be taken, right? There's Dude, a lot of Chans out there. I, you don't understand. I get mistaken for so many Leonard, different Leonard Chans. So, I mean, there's like the whole, like, uh, it's like the Spider-Verse. It's, it's insanity. Like, there's so many different Leonard Chans who I get confused for. So, like, uh, so just starting from the beginning, like, I had a package that I was getting delivered to another mailbox, it got to another Leonard Chan, who thankfully I knew who he was because he called me and was like, hey, I have Kindles that were meant for you. I was like, yeah. So- No, was, that's hilarious. And then, and then I, uh, I got a call like a year and a half ago from a reporter at The Hill, which is a, um, which is a- Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a politics. Um, the politics yeah. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they, they were like, hey, do you have any comment on this whole situation where like some people are, because you're running for, for uh, as a rep in Texas and there's, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> there's yeah, you're, you're That's madness. That you're only running because you're Asian. Do you have any comment on this? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. And then I <laughs> went off on it, even though it was a different, it was a completely different Leonard Chan. He Yo, was a that Republican. Is but they, they so call the guy in Canada. Responded. What's that? But they, they yeah, and the weird thing is they Canada. contacted me through my they contacted me through my website, which says I'm a comedian from Canada. So I was like, "Yo, the Hill, your reporting uh, standards are real shit." So, and I was like, "So if I give you a response, maybe they'll print this, and this will be insane." So I basically, wow. I I was like, "Yeah." And I plugged Andrew Yang and I slammed Trump a little bit. Wow. I was like, this would be insane if they plugged this. But like, and I wasn't saying, okay, I was like, oh, you know, the reason I'm running, oh no, I didn't say the reason I'm running. I was like, well, you know, if I were to run, this is blah, blah, blah. Like I, I coded the language. So in no way was I lying. <laughs> but, Did, but like, was this all in tweets? Uh, no, this was an email. And then, and then I tweeted the thing that happened, the hill, and then that got retweeted. And then the Leonard Chan, who was in Texas, we started having a conversation, saying how hilarious this is. And if it wasn't for the oh, pandemic, or actually, my God. if it wasn't, yeah, he was going to bring me down there to do a fundraiser for him in Texas. Oh, my God. Dude. And then I was actually, Did, and I right, even helped him, <clears throat> I even helped him write jokes for a, um, he had to do a debate or something like that. And, and he was like, hey, I need some help actually with like writing stuff. I was like, all right, what do you got? And I was like, wait, before I help you, because I, I know you're a Republican, what are your stances on taxes and gun control and this and this? I was like, I need to know, because I want to help you if I don't agree with you. So I grilled him and they gave wow. me good answers. I was like, all right, you're a decent person. All right, I'll help you. So I did that. And then, so that's another Leonard Chan I got confused for. And then- Dude, you should have this got, framed and on your wall. Like all the tweets and the replies and you should have that framed guy. Yeah. And then I got confused for another Leonard Chan in Alberta who was committing fraud and he like freaking open credit cards all over the goddamn province and just like abandoned and didn't pay them. And I ended up like, and then that got on my credit score and it's, it's actually messing me up right now. Like it's costing me tens of thousands of dollars. It's very upsetting, but it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, oh my God. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Like I, this get, is a, I get confused for so many different letter chats. It's nuts. As a horrible comedian that I am, uh, yeah. <laughs> and this is why I tell people, y'all don't understand the way that comedians think, right? Have you turned this into a 25 minute bit yet? 
oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm working on it. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's gonna be like a fucking one man show. Like there's so much that's happened. Like, but stuff it just has keeps to happening, be, so I can't stop. Like it just keeps happening. Big screens up. You gotta have big screens yeah, up, and you you show the tweets one by one how it's and how yeah, it yeah, yeah. transitioned. It, oh, dude, oh, I'm signing up. I want to see that so bad. That is hilarious, guy. It's gonna be to a have a thing. name, yeah. like my real name is so weird that I don't yeah. have that happening a lot. But within the past, okay, so he's about in his thirties now. There's one other guy in Trinidad that has the same exact name as me, but we all know each other. It's like you know, three families because my yeah. we're, my last name is so not, it's just not heard of. So I understand on such a micro level what, what it is to have somebody else with your name, but Leonard yeah. Chan must be that, that's asinine. That is, wow. Wow, guy. Wow. I remember the joke you do about uh, Jackie Chan, your wife, right? Yeah. No, well, not Jackie Chan. The, okay, you see, that's another whole story by itself right there. That Jackie Chan joke is beautiful. All right, listen, let me let, me let you run, guy. I've taken up uh, too much of your time. And like I, I was saying, I appreciate pleasure, it man. so it's much. We have always, to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have, we have to do it again. Um, yeah. So I guarantee that there is going to be a point in time where I'm going to uh, sliver off an hour of your time again in the not too distant yeah. future without 15 minutes of trying to open up a Zoom and send the email to you <laughs> and getting you. Yeah. I'll be better by then. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to have to get at least 20 episodes in before I do that again. So, uh, so that I'm, I'm proficient. I'm Just let me know <laughs> by, and I'm in. By that, that time, it'll be AR. It'll be uh, augmented reality. I will mean, be sitting Dude, next about, to each I'm other. About to, I'm about to do a virtual reality show and like Six days. So, we can talk about this offline. This, this all this shit this, is like, the shit is this, evolving. This is getting fast. too far. This it's going too fast. far for me. Yeah, I have to I talk know. to I David mean, Green you because of his, his VR. Yeah. All right. It's cool, man. Learn, learn to walk and then run. But right. <laughs> <laughs> Before tell, you tell stumble you, and fall. I'll tell you how to get there. I'll, I'll, I'll run ahead. I'll tell you how to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> it's always better when somebody knows the way to come back and show you the way. So you go, exactly. come back and tell me. Yo, I'm thank you very much, I'll Leonard. Stop. I appreciate you so much, my brother. Have a good thank one. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, bro.